so welcome back. And I just will make a few remarks before introducing Judge Coburn. The a little bit of housekeeping. One item you might note is that we've made it to the big time. This series is now profiled in the uh, FDU Metro, so make sure you get a copy of this around campus and take a look at the story below the fold. Next week we'll make it above the fold, I'm sure. <laughs> Next week we will have uh, Ms. Lucy Dalglish from the committee, uh, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. She will be discussing shield laws and the state of journalism in the 21st century, but her emphasis will be talking about uh, the necessity or lack thereof for a national shield law and what protections it would afford to journalists, both traditional and of the Perez Hilton variety. So uh, make sure you come to that session as well, if you have the time. We, uh, we, we begin, I'm gonna to begin today going back to the fall of 2005 when John Roberts, currently your Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but then simply the most successful appellant uh, lawyer in the, in the world, uh, John Roberts was then appearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee trying to make his case for why he should be appointed to the position of, of Chief Justice. And among other things, he emphasized his humility in the face of the law and in the face of the challenges he would uh, embrace as a, as a Chief Justice. I'll quote from him during these uh, initial remarks so you can get a flavor of these, of these comments. He said, judges and justices are servants of the law not the other way around. Judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. It is a limited role. Nobody ever went to a ball game to see the umpire. Later he went on to elaborate that, I have no agenda, but I do have a commitment. If I am confirmed, I will confront every case with an open mind, I will decide every case based on the record according to the rule of law, and I will remember that it's my job to call <coughs> balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. Well, whatever the merits of this account of umpiring and judging, uh, Justice Roberts was confirmed quite handily, I think something like a 72 to, you do the math for me, I'm obviously a political scientist, not a math major, but uh, he had a decisive bipartisan uh, margin uh, in, his, in his favor and is of course our current Chief Justice. But that's only one picture of umpiring and possibly only one picture of judging. So perhaps unwittingly, well, certainly unwittingly, Judge Roberts uh, gave us a nice uh, connection to our current topic, our current discussion, which is an, an, an examination of the judicial role perhaps and the nature of judicial activism and how judges are selected more specifically. So what is the nature of umpiring? Well, Judge Roberts made one suggestion, but there's, a, uh, there's an old joke about umpiring shared by umpires occasionally, but shared by judges as well, that gets to the heart of how umpiring itself is contestable. So in the joke, there's three umpires sitting around after a baseball game discussing what they do. Have you heard this joke before? No? Okay. So the first one says, I'm a really good umpire. I, uh, I call them like I see them. Okay? Balls and strikes, whatever your favorite sport might be, or your favorite judging analogy might be. I call them like I see them. The second one says, well, I'm even better than that, puffs up his chest and says, I call them like they are, okay? The third one says, uh, looks at her, her compatriots smugly and says, until I call them, they aren't. So many thousands of pages have been spent in law reviews and academic journals trying to understand the nature of the judicial role. And to some degree, some aspects of that debate track this conversation. What is it that judges do? What is it that umpires do? How should we best understand the judicial role? Fortunately, to help us sort all this out in an hour or so, we have uh, Judge Don Coburn with us today, who will be a, a most excellent guide in uh, thinking about some of these issues. Judge Coburn has an interesting and varied background that plays in nicely to, uh, again, the themes of today's conversation and to some of these issues underlying the umpire analogy. He also serves as a nice bridge between our recent conversations with the Morris County Prosecutor and Professor Koppel and his discussion of forensic science administration and the human role in criminal justice. Don Coburn received his BA from Cornell and was a lieutenant in the United States Army. He subsequently obtained his 
JD, his law degree, from the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. He was a law clerk to Chief Justice Joseph Weintraub of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and was also served as uh, an assistant Essex County prosecutor. So again, to some degree, uh, uh, mirroring or reflecting some aspects of Mr. Bianchi's diverse background. He was in private legal practice and was then an elected representative to the 1976 Democratic Convention, served as a councilman for the Livingston Township, and in 1978, then New Jersey Governor uh, Brendan Byrne appointed him Essex County Prosecutor, where he served for three years and was then appointed to the position of Superior Court Judge, which all my students know is the name for the trial court in New Jersey. In 1996, he was appointed, I think they called elevated, to uh, the uh, appellate division of the Superior Court and be served in that role for uh, until 2008 when he briefly retired, fairly briefly retired, and decided to, uh, he can perhaps tell us why, decided to return uh, back to the bench and in a, um, in a uh, temporary role as uh, in accepting a recall to, to the uh, appellate division. So given this background, uh, Judge Coburn is, uh, in my mind, ideally suited to help us start thinking about or to further refine our thinking about both judicial activism and judicial selection, two aspects of today's courts that are often touchstones for uh, much criticism and complaining about the contemporary judiciary. So with that, please join me in welcoming Judge Don Coburn. That's your stuff, I will not take it. I'll leave you a pen. Thank you, Professor. And good afternoon. As indicated, I'll be talking about, first about judicial selection, uh, then about this concept of activism, which you'll find is perhaps more complex than you might have previously thought. And then I'm gonna spend some time talking about Citizens United, which is the most recent opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States on the right of corporations to participate. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, in the electoral process by spending money from their treasuries. We'll talk about judicial selection first. I'm going to talk about it at the state level because at the federal level it is a settled uh, proposition as to how it's done, but in the states uh, there is a lot of variety. There is appointment normally by a governor. There are partisan elections, where people run in the general election at the same time as politicians are running, nonpartisan elections, and so-called merit plans. I want to suggest to you that after I've briefly discussed these various plans, I hope that you will come to the conclusion that the appointive system uh, is the preferable system particularly if it is coupled with something that is not common today, and that is with a form of merit selection to buttress the appointive system. Judicial selection, as you very well know, is very important. It was of concern to our founding fathers even before the Constitution of the United States was adopted. If you look in the Declaration of Independence, you'll find that there are about 27 reasons why we told England to leave us alone and why we were separating. The ninth reason had to do with judges. And what Thomas Jefferson wrote was that the king, quote, has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their office and the amount and payment of their salaries. In other words, at that time, in this country, if a judge gave a decision that was displeasing to the king, the king could cut off his salary or could fire him, remove him from office. When it came time to write the United States Constitution, the founders proposed, as I think you all well know, that the process go as follows. The president would select the person, obtain the consent of the Senate, 
and then appoint the person as judge. And that was true of the Supreme Court and all the lower federal courts as well. Once appointed, the judge could stay for life. And of course, the salaries could not be reduced uh, while uh, the judge was in office. The Founding Fathers chose this method because to them, based on their experience, the most important value to secure was the independence of the judiciary. They certainly were aware that they could have made judges uh, chosen by election. They chose to not have election because rather than be concerned with accountability to the public or to the majority, their goal was to ensure that the judges would be independent. In other words, they wanted to protect the judiciary from politics to best ensure that judges would remain as free as possible to be true to the law. And so the proposal was enshrined in the Constitution. And these were not impractical people. They were well aware that even the minds of honest men could be influenced both consciously and unconsciously by their experience, their interest, and their politics. But they wanted to create an atmosphere that most often resulted in legal issues being resolved by traditional methods of legal analysis. And so again, they chose independence over accountability. In the early years, most of the states used the same methods and for the same reason. But over time in our country, that changed in movements that generally began in the Midwest and the Far West. By the way, New Jersey is one of, I think it's six states that literally follows the federal uh, model. Our judges are selected by the governor, appointed with the consent of the Senate. The only difference is that here in New Jersey, we serve for seven years, have to be reappointed by the governor, approved by the uh, Senate, and then we serve until age 70. Let's talk about the uh, four methods, and not in great detail, but um, briefly. Uh, the appointive system, the governor, it's usually the governor who chooses the, uh, the candidate, although I think there are one or two states still where the legislature is actually the body that chooses the uh, individual to be judge. Very often that initial appointment involves political considerations, whether done by the governor or the legislature. Um, in most states, unlike the federal system, there is a reappointment after a number of years, but then the judge is free to remain in office um, without uh, being further troubled by um, any process to keep him in office. Uh, the partisan elections. Uh, at one time, a majority of states used this method. Um, not so today. Today, there are only about 10 states that still elect judges at the same time as they elect other uh, elected officials. In most of those states, though, the judges do not run initially. Somebody retires, dies or whatever, and the, ju and the, and the governor will appoint uh, a, uh, an individual to become the judge in place of that person. Generally, a process that has some degree of political involvement, the degree to which depends on the governor. The problem with that system is that in each of those states, after some number of years, and it varies from state to state, the judge must stand for re-election, and sometimes uh, even again for re-election later in his career at set times. The number of contested elections has been growing and they've become more acrimonious, sometimes inane. The amount of money spent has increased substantially. Polling shows that most people, not in the United States, but in the states where, where the polling has been done, believe that judges who 
have to run for office, whether initially or for, re or for retention, and who have to go to people to raise money in order to do that, are unduly influenced by the people who give them the money. The judges themselves who run for office, the majority, find the process demeaning, find the elections um, pretty meaningless and unrelated to either their quality uh, or to their work. The um, nonpartisan elections are a process that was gone to, to depoliticize um, the selection of judges. Um, and it works to a degree, but the problem with that system is that very few people vote in the elections. It's somewhat similar to Board of Education elections in this state. Um, and again, uh, even though they may not have been selected politically initially, they have to go to people to raise money uh, to be uh, retained or to run in the first instance, and again, are subject to the problems that that creates. The merit plans, the first one was developed in uh, Missouri many years ago, <clears throat> were designed to further depoliticize the process, and generally what occurs there is that a commission is created that's supposed to be diverse and have as its responsibility reviewing applications from people who want to be judges and then making a suggestion to the, to the governor of a list of people, the governor then being limited to selecting from that list. Whether the commission system works well or not depends an awful lot on the membership of people uh, in the commission. But again, uh, in those states, we still require retention elections. So once more, the judges become subject uh, to the political process and aware during their early years that they are going to be subject uh, to that process and have to raise money in order to run for office. Personally, on this subject, I would accept the judgment of the Founding Fathers. I think they rightly understood that the key to a healthy judiciary is its independence and not its accountability. There are a couple of problems with emphasizing accountability. First, elections don't really ensure it because often they are fought about aspects of the judges or aspects of judging that are really unrelated to whether the particular judge is qualified or not qualified. Another problem with accountability is that judges aren't supposed to decide what the majority of the people want. Rather, their job is to figure out what the law dictates. And when the law's dictates are not clear, which is not infrequent, we still want judges to solve problems, not by trying to figure out what a majority of people in the community might want, but rather by pursuing the judicial models of thought and analysis. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who retired from the Supreme Court not so long ago, and who has been fighting a battle across the country to get rid of the elective system for choosing judges wrote, and I quote, judicial elections are not just, are, ju are, are difficult to justify in a constitutional democracy in which even the majority is bound by the law's restrictions. And she added uh, further in response to the Supreme Court's recent decision permitting corporations to spend their own money at will in election contests which is the Citizens United uh, case, that that decision creates an increasing problem for maintaining uh, an independent judiciary. That's probably particularly so because the, since the attention paid to judicial election is so small, 
money spent is probably likely to have a disproportionate power in causing the result. Okay, so much for selecting judges. <clears throat> More interesting topic, I think, is this question of judicial activism. This is complicated. Some of the characteristics that are thought to fall within the definition of activism are one, deciding cases on broad or constitutional grounds when more limited rulings will resolve the dispute. Secondly, ignoring, misreading, or overruling precedent, precedent or prior decisions of the court. Thirdly, invalidating executive or legislative action as contrary to the Constitution. Four, enhancing individual rights despite contrary majority views by broadly interpreting intentionally vague constitutional provisions. When some of those actions are taken, those are who are opposed to the decisions often accuse the court of legislating or making law instead of interpreting law. Or the accusation is that the judges are permitting their personal preferences to interfere with judgment as to what the law might dictate. I want you to consider some real life examples of what some people have called activism it may affect your view as to the value of at least some forms of activism. First of all, let's take overruling precedent, not following a decision previously made by the court. If the United States Supreme Court didn't do that on occasion, we might still have racial segregation, our telephones could be tapped without a judicial warrant based on probable cause, we would be unable to enact minimum wage laws. Also, corporations would be unable to spend at will to support or oppose candidates running for public office. That's the Citizens United case. Take the aspect of expansive application of vague constitutional principles or and this is subject to argument, adopting principles that are implicit, not express, but implicit in the Constitution. Those approaches have ensured an individual's right to birth control and abortion, same-sex physical relations, all those based on the concept of privacy, which is not expressed in the Constitution, but has been found by the court to be implicit. Some are more uh, argue, or, or things that people have stronger feelings about than others, but my guess is that if you took the issue of a couple's right to use or purchase birth control, there isn't a single member on the United States Supreme Court now that would oppose that. Knowledge that a criminal defendant is entitled to a lawyer's assistance when, uh, when arrested, that's Miranda, not expressed in the Constitution, but implicit. And indeed, that a defendant is entitled to have a lawyer throughout criminal proceedings paid for at least initially by the state or by the federal government. In the early days of the Republic, reliance on implicit principles gave us one of our most famous cases, Marbury versus Madison, and that established the Supreme Court's authority to overrule as unconstitutional an act of Congress or an act of the legislature. You will not find in the Constitution of the United States a statement that the Supreme Court has that power. And yet I guarantee you that there is not a member of the Supreme Court now, 
and hasn't probably been for hundreds of years, who would say that the Supreme Court erred in making that decision. Another aspect of activism relating to that is that it wasn't necessary in that case to even reach that issue. That was a principle of law that came about by what we call dictum, namely a statement not necessary for the decision and yet in the decision. So that was a form of activism. There are some, act, uh, some aspects of what we call activism that all of us tend to reject, including judges. Thus, we all accept that it is wrong to impose personal preferences or to ignore or misread prior decisions. As judges, we never knowingly do that, though we are suspicious sometimes of some of our colleagues <laughs> who we think have done it, although they would assure us that they had not. Judges vary on the degree to which they tend to defer to executive or legislative decisions. Remember, that's one of the aspects of activism, failure to defer uh, to the elected bodies. But there is not a judge in this country who doesn't also recognize that if the Constitution so requires, then the executive act or the legislative act must be overruled by the court. The battle, of course, is over the when, and that is very often a very complex decision. And it's particularly difficult because the applicable constitutional provisions are often vague and were intentionally made so by the founding fathers. Ideas like due process, those words are in the Constitution, equal protection, freedom of speech, none of those has a simple meaning. If you had asked the Founding Fathers at the time what they meant by it, you would have heard all kinds of different views and they would have probably said to you, you know, some things are better left to be figured out over time. You're aware, I'm sure, that some lawyers and judges argue that the answer to difficult constitutional questions can be determined by finding the original intent uh, of the uh, drafters of the Constitution. The truth is, it often involves guesswork, it's often difficult, and if you read honest opinions by both sides of, of uh, justices wrestling with that question, you can't help but come to the conclusion that chasing that rabbit is not going to be successful, uh, that somehow you've got to approach the problem differently. We all recognize as judges, and you expect, that we will generally follow precedent. On the other hand, we also all agree that sometimes you have to overrule cases because they are, the earlier decision is simply wrong. Again, the problem is figuring out when and in what circumstances it's appropriate to do it. Sometimes you hear people talking about legislating from the bench or making law and describing that as something inappropriate when what we ought to be doing is interpreting the law. Well, the judges all agree, and I think people understand, that we're not supposed to make the law in the way that a legislature does. Legislature acts politically. Its acts are restrained only by the Constitution itself. The legislators can freely vote their own preference or those of their constituents and then defend themselves when they're up for re-election. Judges do not represent constituencies. And unlike legislators, they are bound to use 
reason to get to the results. Cases are often presented to a court, especially a high court, specifically because there is no precedent directly on point. So what does a court do? The court, its judges, has to look to general principles and decide from often conflicting principles which should apply to this case. The choice results in new law. And in that sense, law is made, and even those judges who talk about the fact that you shouldn't be making law understand that in that sense, law is made. The argument is not really about the need to make law, but rather the extent to which judges should make law. Small changes tend to be acceptable. Larger changes are sometimes needed to achieve justice, but are more difficult for a society uh, to accept. To many, this argument over activism and its opposite judicial restraint concerns the question of who should control change in our society. Some say that change should be left to the legislatures at the state and federal level. But that claim, I think, is based on a false concept, namely that the law is clear enough, particularly in the federal constitution, so that change need not come from the judiciary. The problem is that many of the great issues that we face are not so readily answered. And when those issues come before a court, particularly the Supreme Court, it must provide an answer as best it can by implying, applying an interpretive process to language that gives only general direction and not discrete answers. To those who disagree, the resulting opinion may seem activist, but it doesn't make it so in an, in an invidious sense. There's a tendency to put Supreme Court justices in two camps, liberal and conservative, although the justices rarely fit uniformly in one camp or another. In any case, those forms of activism which are not uniformly rejected can be found in the opinions of both camps, and that will no doubt always be the case. And partly that is so because as, Justifer, as Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously observed, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. This brings me to uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. This is not, I think, an example of justices simply trying to put their own values or views into the Constitution. However, the case was certainly activist in these regards. As you probably noticed by now, activism can come from both what some people consider the left and what some people consider uh, the right. This case obviously could have been decided on the initial grounds that were submitted to the court by the parties. It involved questions of statutory construction. That's the issue that the parties presented to the court. The um, Citizen United were simply saying that the statute should not be applied to them not necessarily because of the Constitution, but because of a proper reading of the statute. Second, it was the court itself that raised the constitutional question. This case came about after it was argued fully on the, on the statutory grounds, and then the court itself, or at least four members of the court, decided no, they wanted to reach the broader constitutional issue very unusual. Not necessarily wrong, by the way, but unusual. Thirdly, the majority's opinion, uh, its treatment of some of the prior cases might not be entirely fair, although I think the same could be said about the dissent as well. Fourth, activists, the court overruled uh, 
its prior precedent. Two cases, one of them relatively recent, were overruled by this decision. Fifth, in overruling its precedent, the court rejected the congressional determination respecting corporate involvement in elections. In other words, they did not defer to the elected bodies. Maybe right, maybe wrong for you to decide. The resulting judgment enhanced the power of corporations to influence cor elections, which many seem to have viewed as conservatism run amok. Frankly, although I disagree with the judgment of the court, I'm not inclined to agree with those who find it quite so dangerous or offensive, and I want to explain that. Before this decision and after it, corporations could form political action committees to spend money, any amount of money, for or against candidates. They're called PACs. Now, they don't have quite the same amount of money as a wealthy corporation has. They're limited to raising money from shareholders and employees. But I dare say, if the shareholders and employees of large corporations wanted to, they can certainly contribute very substantial amounts of money, and in fact have been doing so increasingly. So PACs can make direct contributions to candidates. Those, those are political action committees formed by the corporations. The statute that we're dealing with only disallowed some corporate spending from corporations from their own coffers, their own treasuries. The statute didn't exclude this entirely. It permits unlimited spending by corporations from their treasuries until 30 days before a primary election, this is at the federal level, or 60 days before the general election. Also, this case left untouched a prohibition that goes back to 1907 to a statute enacted by Congress, which prohibited corporations from making direct contributions to candidates. That's still not allowed, and it's not allowed on the theory that that would be too corrupting, or at least would appear to be too corrupting. So one could criticize this opinion for being too activist, but let's put the issue of activism to one side and ask the question, was the case wrongly decided or not? This is interesting. Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, noted that Chief Justice Warren, former Chief Justice Warren, Justices Douglas and Black, all considered strong liberal justices, had actually expressed in dissent their view that the First Amendment protected corporations and entitled them to speak out freely in elections. Linda Greenhouse, who writes for the New York Times uh, in analyzing the opinions of the Supreme Court, described the statute that the court struck in this way, ham -handed, a ham-handed measure that accomplishes too little at too great a cost to the First Amendment. Also consider this, both sides in this case, the majority and, and the dissent, accepted that a case called Bilotti was correctly decided. Bilotti held that a corporation could not be prevented in any way from using its own treasury to support or defeat a referendum. That the constitutional right to freedom of speech guaranteed to corporations the right to do that. If that's so, it's not entirely illogical to take the next step 
and find that a corporation has the right to similarly express itself on whether a candidate should be elected or not. Will the impact of this, this decision be as great as the dissenters believe, and as uh, some have written in the press, I tend to doubt it. For some of the reasons I've already mentioned, in addition, the majority notes, the majority opinion notes that in 26 states, there are no limits on independent corporate spending for or against candidates. And I don't think there's any evidence that in those days that has resulted in corporations disproportionately affecting elections. Perhaps that is because the dangers inherent in openly taking sides in an election are too much. In other words, think of yourself as somebody who's selling whether it's cars or widgets or whatever. You have an important corporate name. Do you really want to put it on the side of a liberal candidate or a conservative candidate and thereby offend maybe 40 or 50 percent of your potential purchasers? I tend to doubt it. And I think that that's why in those 26 states, corporations have not been dis disproportionately spending their own money. And my guess is that it's probably unlikely that they will do so, particularly because if it matters so much to them, they still have their PACs, their political action committees, as do, of course, uh, blocks on what may be the other side, the liberal side, unions, and so on. Done. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did I went to a min ten minutes too long? My apologies. Not a problem. So we'll open things up now to Q and A. Please ask questions of Judge Coburn. Oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, What's to prevent a corporation from funneling money under Citizens United to a nonprofit and thereby hiding their identity and escaping the public relations aspect of supporting a candidate? Nonprofit corporations are under the same limit as, prop as profit corporations. They, too, um, uh, cannot give money directly uh, to a candidate. So th there would be. Uh, Nothing to be gained by doing that. Yes. Oh, sorry. another question over here. Do you really think anything needs to be done about judicial activism, or do you think it's kind of just the dirty truth <clears throat> of the judicial system that generally will result in something that maybe not the general public agrees with, but upholds the rule of law in the long term? I, it's in essence it, it is the question of what is, is uh, judicial activism a danger? Does it endanger? Uh, our democracy, I think, um, uh, and result in unelected officials deciding issues that we think should be decided by the majority. It's an enormously complex problem. Uh, we're dedicated to two things in this country. We're dedicated to majority rule, but we're also dedicated to minority rights. Uh, and um, minority rights, uh, individual rights, I mean, not minority rights, individual rights. And individual rights are, in fact, not clearly defined in the Constitution itself, and they never have been. Um, so that activism in the, um, of the proper sort, not just giving an opinion because that's what you want uh, the law to be, uh, is something that is intrinsic. It's unavoidable. Um, frankly, I'm among those who look at the courts and, and, and feel that although a lot of good has resulted from uh, activism, um, that harm has uh, resulted from it as well, uh, both at the state levels and the federal levels. Um, 
but it's not a left-right political thing. It, depending on the time in, um, that you look at, there have been times when the court has been more conservative than, than the general majority, when it's been more liberal than the, than the general majority. And whether the, the decisions are good or bad, you know, depends uh, on your view. Um, I think judges need to think hard about judicial restraint. Um, and, um, and Citizens United is probably a good example of that, where, um, you know, in my view, I think Stevens and dissent probably gets the better of the argument. And we'd probably be better off and truer to the Constitution uh, if we recognize that. Uh, but it's, you know, it, you create a monster and you're stuck with it. I, one of the things I thought about when I was getting ready for this is uh, Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, and his monster. Uh, did his monster have a right to due process? <laughs> I mean, the, the um, Declaration of Rights, the, the Declaration of Independence talks about we the people to secure our liberties. Uh, it doesn't talk about corporations. Um, so I suppose the citizens had a right to kill the, the monster that was created not by God but, um, but by man. Well, we created corporations. I mean, corporations are total fiction, something that, that uh, a concept that, that people developed. Why can't we limit uh, what they do? Or why can't we leave the limiting uh, to the majority? Why isn't that not a majority decision? And yet you look at a, an issue like the referenda case and say, my God, shouldn't a corporation be able to fight against a referendum that maybe is going to put it out of business or harm its business in some way? Um, I think the answer is uh, to keep pressing judges for, for to exercise restraint, but recognizing that uh, that's not simple. Uh, it's not just liberal versus conservative, um, and that, and 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 understanding that for the most part, though it may not look that way from outside the court. From outside the court, it's much easier to say that's the left wing, that's the right wing, and things like that. If you actually talk to the justices, most of the time, 99 out of 100 times, probably even in Bush v. Gore you would find that people were going about their job analytically analyzing legal principles and, and, and not consciously indulging themselves in, in, in putting their own uh, view um, in place. But I'm not sure about that. I know of one case in New Jersey, one famous case in New Jersey, um, where the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court consciously, consciously um, uh, did an interpretation that was clearly, clearly wrong. And they knew it. Um, it was a good decision, actually. <laughs> you, you can look for Judge Coburn's movie, Frankenstein's Monster and Civil Liberties this summer. It, it will be a 3D movie. In the meantime, we have a uh, question in the second row here. Why do you think, say, for the Supreme Court, for example, would take a case with such a narrow scope and broaden it like they did in Citizens v. Um, FEC or, say, Griswold v. Connecticut, which established basically the right to privacy? Um, why do you think courts would take such a narrow, a case with such a narrow scope and then broaden it the way they do? I think if you talk about Citizens Union, I think Justice Kennedy honestly believed that the case, uh, Austin, that was decided before was terribly, horribly wrong. Uh, and, and that it was important to vindicate the First Amendment that the court reached the issue and decided as he did. I think he really believed that. Uh, if the mm -hmm. Congress did pass multiple laws limiting this decision, which, at least in the shows I watched, were, were being discussed as a viable option, 
uh, and passed a number and apparently maybe even executive privilege passed some limitations. I don't know if that's possible or not. It's none of it's important. Uh, would you think this would have any influence on the judges or should have some influence on the judges' decisions on these uh, limiting features to their own. There was a, many, many years ago, there was a famous writer about politics on the court, Finley Peter Dunn, and he said, the court follows the flag. Um, does it do that consciously, unconsciously? I'm, I, I'm, I don't know the answer to that, but you can think of examples like upholding the internment of uh, the Japanese in World War II. A very difficult decision to understand, except perhaps in the context of, uh, of war. Um, but there's no question that the, the courts are influenced, and maybe properly so, by, uh, by the tenure of the times, by what's out there. Um, I think of the, uh, the, 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 the courts that, that initially, the Supreme Court initially turning down, rejecting um, much of the legislation, very important legislative acts by uh, Congress when Roosevelt was trying to pull us out of the Depression. Um, it wasn't many years later when the theories that were used to do that were totally rejected uh, by a court that perhaps looking around came to understand that uh, those decisions just didn't make sense anymore uh, for the times. And I think that's part of what a court has to do. And, uh, and properly so. We'll take one more question over here. Judge Coburn, without putting you on the spot, but could you discuss uh, activism with the New Jersey Supreme Court on, on their ruling for many years about giving students with education a fair, you know, the money? Sure, sure. Complex. The, um, I'll, I'll make a few comments about it. I'm not sure if I'll directly answer you, but the, the, we have a constitutional provision in New Jersey that says that the state shall ensure a thorough and efficient education uh, for students between the ages of six or seven, something like that, and 18. Um, the court uh, was confronted many, many years ago um, with that case, and, and, and they argued then two points. Uh, they argued thorough and efficient education. They argued equal protection of the laws. California had rejected equal protection of the laws. Our Supreme Court rejected equal protection, and I think they did so, I know they did so, in part because of concern about, well, if you apply that to education, then what would you have to do with respect to other services provided by towns, police, fire, and so on? Would everybody be entitled to equal um, treatment there? So they decided that um, everybody was entitled to a thorough and efficient education. Well, that, that's sort of obvious because the Constitution says it. Um, but then, Without defining what a thorough and efficient education was, they concluded that too many people weren't getting it, and therefore that more money ought to, have, ought to be spent. And a lot of money has been spent on that theory. Uh, and interestingly enough, to the point where in recent years, they're actually often expending more money because of court order in some of the districts that uh, that are um, getting the advantage of that uh, decision. Um, in addition, in a de decision some years ago, the court found that uh, pre-first grade education was required, even though the people of getting that were below the age set in the Constitution. The argument was that it was implicit because the evidence showed that if you didn't attack the problem there, uh, then just starting the first grade wouldn't get you a thorough and efficient education. Um, 
serious issues, and, and I don't really know uh, the answer to it. it. It's a problem because what's happened is that the state has been forced to spend money in that area, monies that could have been spent in other areas that have also suffered because we don't have enough money to do uh, everything. Uh, and so I think, I, I certainly understand why some people feel that's a court going uh, too far. Um, and that often happens when, when, when a court gets into an area where it's making social policy. Sometimes it goes down better, like Brown versus Board of Education, at least eventually, uh, and sometimes uh, not. We're probably better off for it in our state that the court followed that course, uh, but it's certainly a debatable one, uh, that's for sure. Thank you.